right, let's go on to the next question. Elaine, I'm gonna ask you to tell us about what are the signs and symptoms that would pr prompt a clinician to suspect Alzheimer's disease? Since most of these patients will most likely be in the MCI to mild AD phase, it's not an obvious presentation. So uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the value and how do you approach it? Well, the, um, the domains of thinking functions or cognition that are most uh, affected early on are memory and executive function. Executive function is ability to plan and sequence and carry out a complex task. With respect to memory, the, um, often the earliest um, sign symptoms are being repetitive in conversation, being forgetful of recent events, not remembering so well to take your medications or how to organize your medications, sometimes not paying the bills on time. If a person was doing the taxes year after year and this year they can't do the taxes. Um, and then and Richard brought up uh, word finding difficulty and often at this stage word finding difficulty now becomes may become apparent in your examination of the patient in which you find yourself supplying, you know, the person's uh, you know, slowing down their conversation, they have a blank space where they're trying to think of the word and you find yourself providing the mm -hmm, word. Mm -hmm. That should be a clue to you. Um, in the primary care setting, you know, the person has diabetes or has hypertension and you, you, know, you think your, your, uh, your care is providing what should manage these conditions well, but still, there's not good control. And um, you should suspect that maybe the person's not taking their medications, maybe not remembering to take their medications. Yeah, those are, those are great signs. One of the things that I recently uh, had a discussion around, I saw a 56-year-old uh, with Alzheimer's disease, amyloid positive scanning, um, and his main complaint uh, was slowness, that he simply couldn't accomplish things that he was used to accomplishing mm -hmm. in his uh, employment uh, at the same rate that he could before. So it wasn't really specifically memory, and I wondered whether that was maybe a little bit more characteristic of the early onset disease, that they're in the employment environment, they're having a different set of, de uh, of demands on them, uh, and slowness was the primary primary complaint. Any, anybody else heard that or, or seen that in young patients? Yeah, I, um, so a, a big part of my practice is actually seeing people who have early onset changes. And I would say, um, typically, atypical presentations are, are typical. Um, and, and so it's not all memory all the time. I think that mental efficiency changes and, I, and early changes, I think, in, in mood and sleep as individuals actually work harder and harder to compensate uh, in a work environment and, and multiple challenges in their life. And so those, those things become apparent a lot earlier to other folks. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's not just memory, so it's that mental efficiency uh, that goes down. Very good, Marwan. You uh, look like you want to write. Recently, yeah. I uh, noticed uh, I was told about something called the head turning sign, and I've started looking for it, and I find it to be pretty common. And so, the head turning sign is you ask the patient uh, something, and they'll answer, and then they'll turn to their their okay. next of kin to confirm it. To confirm it, right? So, yeah. I actually have started documenting in my medical yeah, record seen, if they I've have seen, the sure head turning all, we've, sign. We've all seen that. But yeah. Even uh, I mean, in more advanced cases. How old are you? Yeah. And, and there's, yeah. there's the that's head, exactly there's right. The right. That's exactly right. Just so a little uncertainty about how old they are. And that brings up the point, and I uh, is that part of the evaluation is a careful uh, examination. And I'm not talking physical, neurological. I'm just observing the patient, observing how they think, their fluency, their language, their thought content. So just an observation is really important to the part of the evaluation. I think that's right. Marwan, I want to direct the next question to you. Yeah. Are most cases of Alzheimer's disease diagnosed in primary care or by a neurologist? And continuing in that, how can the primary care doc and the neurologist work together better? Yeah. It's a really important question, Jeff, because I'm seeing it's a big problem. We're noticing in our own clinic at the Cleveland Clinic that uh, the 80% of the referring diagnosis is not the diagnosis we end up entering the medical record. Physicians do not feel comfortable making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. They're still stuck on a B12, TSH, and MRI, and they're like, well, they're normal, so I don't know what this is, so they'll code it as cognitive change. So physicians, primary care physicians in particular, which we expect to make the diagnosis, they can't. In best case scenario, the, re the data suggests it's only accurate somewhere around 66% of the time, and so we know that a clinical diagnosis in, in beyond the super specialist is, is not that 
accurate, only correct two out of three times. So uh, it is, uh, you know, if one thing we can say is that we're trying to push primary care physicians to be more comfortable making the diagnosis, but at least they should say there's an issue and they should refer. And how, how do other people see this question? Well, I, I would say oh. I, I agree with Marwan. I, I think that this is an obstacle that, that is um, surmountable, though. I think um, typical uh, presentations of Alzheimer's disease and mixed conditions, because I think what we're learning is that as people get into their uh, late 70s or, uh, and 80s and, and beyond, actually the rule is having at least two or three different brain changes, including Alzheimer's, vascular ischemic brain injury, and, uh, and other conditions like it. Um, so, you know, I think that with enough support and knowledge, um, primary care clinicians can actually diagnose typical cases uh, well enough, I think, to, to initiate uh, uh, treatments. When there's qu questions about atypical symptoms, rapid progression, early onset, I think those conditions, uh, if there's a movement component, I think those folks really need to be on a fast path to be, to be referred to someone else. And, and this question kind of implies that there should be more of a partnership between primary care and neurologists. And I think maybe we haven't done the best job of that. Uh, it's, it's difficult, of course, because we're all in healthcare systems and we don't have control of these relationships, but we should struggle more with it because I think the primary care physician often would benefit by, by, by more uh, expert in, input, and we would benefit from being able to relate more to the primary care physicians and, and, uh, and have patients more referred more often for clinical trials uh, or for appropriate therapies. Uh, so I think that's a, a goal for all of us. I think that making the diagnosis of the typical presentation of Alzheimer's disease is not difficult, but I think there's a, a, a bit of a problem in your usual primary care practice where uh, appointments are scheduled every 15 or 20 minutes and the uh, primary care uh, provider is dealing with a whole laundry list of other problems and literally doesn't have the time to take that careful history. And also, if you make the diagnosis to deal with, you know, this is a devastating diagnosis. You have to have time to deal with all the, the fallout from that. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a great point, and, and uh, that, that's another reason that I think we need to help our primary care colleagues as, as much as we can. Jeff, I want to make can. a quick point about that. I think, I think that's really, really true, um, and I think what we need to do is to actually allow our colleagues to appreciate that they don't have time not to make the diagnosis, in the sense that when they're dealing with individuals in their 70s and 80s, and we know that the rate of kind of impairment or dementia is upwards of 25 to 40 percent in that group, um, if they're dealing with their own medications, with, with diabetes medications, um, blood pressure medications, other things like that, um, that's dangerous. And so a lot of uh, hospitalizations and uh, ED visits are actually because individuals, their medical condition hasn't changed, it's just their ability to manage it has changed. And unrecognized kind of impairment is really, really costly for time, et cetera, for primary care clinicians. And so if they were to take the time to focus on that during the annual uh, wellness visit or other things, or bringing people back and identifying these folks as complex medical uh, condition, I think uh, their practice would actually save time and money. And, well, I, I, and add... I absolutely agree with you, but I've had even very senior primary care physicians say to me, well, I, you know, I just know that I need to remind them again to take their medications. And then, you know, what, uh, what good is that going to do when they, as soon as they walk out the door, they're going to forget, yeah. so. I wanna add that uh, we, we put the onus on primary care physicians to make a diagnosis, but they get almost no training in their residency about this. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's, a, it's not an accurate way to go about doing this. What we really wanna do is make sure that they detect a change and be willing to refer. I think if we could get that, I think that's our first step, but saying that they can make a diagnosis has not been shown to be very... Yeah, good point. 